Hey everybody and welcome to Let's Look at Flame Break. This is surprisingly difficult to say for me. I always want to say Frame Blake, but that's not really like, I don't know, some kind of LA Clippers based basketball mystery film. This is Flame Break, a totally different thing. What it is is uh, an action RPG, roguelike, let's say roguelite to avoid uh, ruffling any feathers, uh, that has combat similar to a MOBA. Now, I know that a lot of those words are going to make people scoff to begin with. People are going to be like, oh, another roguelite. You know, what is it? A day that ends with why? Oh, a MOBA. I hate those. Yo, I can understand where you're coming from. At the same time, I've played about 70 minutes of this, and the melange works very nicely. This is from Nimbly Games, who also made Bumbledore. I covered that game in, like, 2012. Maybe early... No, I think it was 2012. It was like the first game I covered on my old new computer. And enough time has passed that I think I can say without too much emotion in it, I wasn't really a huge fan of Bumbledore. However, Flame Break has kind of tickled my fancy in all the right ways. It's $10 United States currency on Steam. This is a review copy, by the way. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to tell my cat not to eat my headphone cord, and we'll begin here. So, I'll try to explain what's going on here, but there are a lot of mechanics at play, and also, once you get started, it gets pretty frenetic, pretty fast-paced. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that kind of, I wouldn't say is a learning curve, but a lot of systems that aren't necessarily explicitly explained, uh, so I'm gonna tr do my best to paraphrase them, if that makes sense. So we start here, every run, uh, you have three different characters you can choose from. Every character has a special ability, or as every character has stats, I should say. Um, so for the human, you can see they have, you know, 100 and everything except 500 hit points. Pretty much the most, like, numerically average character in the game, whereas the fairy has um, much higher attack speed, uh, lower HP, but I think higher, um, yeah, higher movement speed. Lower skill mastery, but much faster attack speed. Anyway, and they all have their own unique ability as well. So, for example, the human has Human Squire's Glory, which basically creates a minion uh, that attacks other enemies. You can summon it on a cooldown. Um, and you have fa Fairy Teleport instantly relocated. Higher skill levels, it damages enemies near the destination as well. So this is where kind of the MOBA thing comes in. In addition to that, every character will have a unique weapon. So sometimes you'll have a human with a crossbow, sometimes you'll have a dwarf with a crossbow, sometimes you'll have a dwarf with a sword, sometimes you'll have a fairy with a gun. You get the idea. Those are on different axes. Additionally, you have different skills every single time. Uh, the skills, I believe, are static when it comes to the actual class. So for example, you know, you have Flame Wave as the bottom right skill on this human. I've had Flame Wave on a dwarf, I've had Flame Wave on an elf, etc, etc. Similarly, you know, uh, Skeleton Mines. I've had those on a dwarf before, I've had Shock Wave on a dwarf, even though this character's an elf. So it's almost like you've got a slot machine that lines up every time you start a run. I can't, oh, I can't get to these until I get the... Uh, Spirit level 5. Anyway, um, we should maybe play as the human because it's simple. Let's look at our stats here quickly. So what all I'm getting at is new class every time, new weapon every time, different skills every time. And if you don't like it, you can reroll here as well. But it interrupts your win streak, which is minus 4 for me right now. So not really killing it. Um, so that we have Human Squire's Glory, which is just... Uh, the spawning the minion. Spirit Walk grants unobstructed movement, increases movement speed, and damages enemies on contact. Okay. Uh, Stone Sword has a cleaving blow, increases attack, range, swing, arc, and damage. It's on a small cooldown, I assume. And then Flame Wave is just uh, like an AoE attack. The warring lords have warped the lands and forced its beasts to fight. The ravaged souls that stalk the sands, the creatures of the night. But Pyrian the Wise resides within the Phoenix, free. And where his heart and spirit hides, your journey's end will be. So there is a little bit of a story uh, at play here. I'm hoping that it's not too loud. Um, but I'm also hoping that it's not too quiet. So every time um, you start playing a run, you actually have to go through this tutorial. And the reason is because you've got different skills every time. So they try to reacquaint you with them. You can just speed by it pretty quickly if you want. So I've already attacked. Press left shift to activate Spirit Walk. Gives us much faster speed, as you can see, and damages enemies. Space gives us Flame Wave. Right gives us our minion. Right click, that is. And we will just uh, exit out here. This is the other layer that the game takes place on. This is more of like an FTL style, like, mission selection, if that makes sense. You can imagine that this is our spaceship, and there is a, uh, a shadow that follows behind us, and that shadow basically is a punishment. If we end up in the shadow layer, we have to fight some harder enemies and we get no rewards for it. All of these other ones will, you know, sometimes there'll be a town, sometimes there'll be a, a temple that you have to defend, sometimes there'll be a jeweler who you can buy equipment from, blacksmith, etc, etc. 
Um, but most of these are basically just going to be combat beacons. So we're going to move towards the boss here. And I'm going to do my best to explain just what the heck is going on. It's going to be a little confusing at first. So it's top-down, twin-stick shooter style. I am using mouse and keyboard. It controls just fine. But if you're more of a, a controller fan from Isaac, I guess that thing uh, will work fine for you as well. I just exclusively did uh, melee attacks there because I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. We'll start mixing up our skills now here as well. So we don't have a stun, but we do have an escape. So let's just smack him around, do some damage, make sure to spawn our minion at every available moment. And if we find ourselves in danger, we're just gonna mash on left click like that, and, or sorry, uh, left shift like that and get ourselves in there. Um, you can get more skills, by the way. You can get items that actually give you active abilities. So um, if you wanna pick up uh, one of those, you'll, you'll do so at like a, a shop or a, a blacksmith throughout the town. What's really neat about the uh, mechanics is, first off, there's always something novel to do, if that makes sense. There's always something to, to focus on. Something always comes off cooldown and can be used. Um, so it's actually, like, quite a lot of, of mental energy to actually manage your uh, your available abilities. And unlike MOBAs, where, and I don't mean this to be rude, because I, I have, like, 800 hours in Dota 2, and actively restrict myself from actually playing it because of the fact that it was too addictive for me, um, in MOBAs, you spend like the first eight minutes of the game, at least at the level I was playing at, which is relatively low level, um, farming creeps and just trying to time last hits well, like fucking up the other enemy in your lane a little bit. In this, you're constantly mashing on those abilities, so you don't spend like 30 minutes just doing, you know, farming. Basically, the farming just takes place when you actually beat the levels themselves, so I, th I find that a little bit more engaging on a moment-to-moment -moment level. Not to say that this is a more robust game than, you know, League or Dota 2 or whatever MOBA you're playing uh, for now and forever, but um, well, basically what I'm getting at is that the combat stays fresh because of the fact that there's constantly new abilities to use. We're just gonna fight our boss here. Uh, decent boss variety. For example, I've never seen this boss Cassia before. Uh, I've seen at least three or four on the first uh, on the first uh, series of levels here. I also like how it might seem confusing that, you know, different classes don't have their own, I mean, they have their own unique ability, but they also have other abilities um, that are unique to each individual run, but it creates like interesting situations. Like I had my first run ever, I was a dwarf. The dwarf has like a butt slam that works as a stun uh, that has a pretty low cooldown associated with it. Oh, that hurt us a little bit. We have a lot of HP though, and we can also get items to heal it up or to, to get more HP later. Uh, there's more systems I have to talk about as well here. This is basically, the spirit level is persistent outside of the game and unlocks new stuff for us. But, um, yeah, I had a, like a dwarf run with a sword and an axe, and it was good. I was like, it was good for learning the mechanics of the game, and uh, I, I came away with it feeling pretty good. But then I had a dwarf run right after, where I had like three stuns instead of just the one that the dwarf normally started with, or like he's guaranteed to start with, I should say, and a crossbow. And I was like, this run fucking sucks. But then I got amazing attack speed by buying a bunch of items, and I could just like stun lock enemies over and over and over again, and then shoot the shit out of them with my crossbow. And it ended up being the most successful run I've ever had. So there's been some good stuff there. Um, in town, I like to buy cheese, and if possible, I also like to buy um, a potion, which we don't have now. Um, I also tend to buy as many equipment items as possible. Because equipment items, like if we buy an axe, we don't use that axe. Which is going to be a bone for some people that they're going to have to pick. And it would be nice to be able to buy unique weapons, I suppose. But basically just think of this as buying like a skinny odd mushroom. Or a fat odd mushroom. Or any, any item in Isaac, basically. It's just a stat change. And then it tracks it down to the bottom right, along with our time. Which freezes while we're in rooms. I think that's to like for leaderboard position on daily challenges. So you can spend as much time as you want in here, but in the actual levels, that'll tick up. Um, you can also buy this. It gives us Necrus's favor, which is a tied to the god system in the game, which I don't fully understand. But it also gives us better skill mastery and movement speed. And movement speed in particular is really important. Um, let's uh, move over here. That does take a move, and then we'll do this this hazard area. So hazard areas usually come with a. a like an extra added condition that makes it more difficult. In this case, we've got like an ice wind that's gonna fly around and, and will do damage to us and possibly stun us when it hits us, but it also does damage to enemies. And I try to do these hazards whenever my HP looks pretty good because it, uh, oh, didn't hit me there. Um, or maybe it did, but because all the enemies were dead, it didn't technically hurt. That could, that's another option there. Um, because you get a much larger reward. Also, sometimes you'll stumble upon uh, mini games like this. So this is one where we try to hook enemies, and we only want to hook enemies that have uh, the gold attached to them, and every one we get is going to give us a little bit of a higher reward when it's actually over. I have to tell you, 
This is harder than it looks. <laughs> I I normally don't do this well, but we did a perfect clear on that one. It's only 30 gold, but still, that's not too bad. Uh, let's do a mini boss here. Mini bosses also give you extra gold. Anyway, this run's kind of interesting because it also has a... Oh, this level's kind of interesting because it also has a hazard located here, but... Um, I, I really can't say enough positive things about the ability system in the game. Like, the, the way that you get different abilities almost every si a single time you do it, or a different combination of abilities, at least. Um, because, you know, you can have one like this, which is a little bit focused on, on uh, you know, having... It's well-balanced, I guess. You've got a damage dealer, like a burst damage dealer with the flame wave there. You also have... Um, you know, a little bit of a, an ability to spawn, like, something that can take aggro, and then you have an escape with your Shadow Walk here. But you can also end up with totally fucked up runs that totally work, even. Like, the the stun-locked Dwarf run I was talking about. It's a it's an interesting way to handle things, and it actually works pretty well. Alright, so we can buy uh, equipment here, like rings and amulets and stuff from the jeweler. We have 290 gold. Um, what does this give you? Cooldown reduction plus 10%, that's good. Attack damage plus 20 is good. Attack speed, I think attack speed is really useful, but if we can buy all three, why not buy all three? There's also set bonuses if you complete all of the equipment. Like, for example, if we get all of the Storm Guard armor, blocks incoming damage and shocks nearby enemies for skill mastery times three equals 345 damage once every 11 seconds. A little convoluted, but also a cool, uh, a cool mechanic there. By the way, you can't kill those units by attacking them. Believe you me, I have tried. Uh, so let's talk about the, um, what I would consider to be the negatives a little bit. Uh, I do think that probably the biggest negative, and, you know, I, I do my best to say this without sounding impolite, but the game looks a little generic. Uh, it, it looks a lot like a wizard's lizard, actually, which I don't mean this to be insulting, but makes it seem like it's made in Construct 2. And that's not meant to be insulting. I used Construct 2, and it takes some skill to make good stuff in Construct 2, because everything I made in Construct 2 was shit. Um, what is this? Attack speed? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that, even if it costs us not being able to get the potion. Um, and then we'll just go fight the boss here. Uh, I, I think that's probably the biggest weakness for the game. You know, the, the enemy designs and enemy variety are fine, but it does... Uh, you know, if, if you were looking at this game on the Steam Store page, as I'm sure many of you have, you might look at this and say, this doesn't carry the same kind of, like, graphical interestingness, like that wow factor that a game like maybe Darkest Dungeon does. Just not that, that, that they're genre contemporaries or anything like that, but just to, you know, give you a point of comparison. Like, you know, this doesn't look as unique as something like maybe Braid did eight years ago. Maybe I should get a new, uh, a new game that kind of, uh, fits the bill there. So we cleared this level. When you get to the next level of spirit, you get, uh, like, I unlock the fairy class by doing that. I unlock some new skills by doing that. And again, those skills just go into the random rotation, basically. Um, I really think that's the biggest weakness of the game. 120, so let's see. Yeah, we can buy some cheese. And I think I can buy these gloves, which are probably attack speed. And then also that potion. Potions are important. These are overworld items, like up here at the top. I've never really used these, except I used a dust of appearance once. Reveal secret paths through impassable terrain on the overworld map and extra purchase items in shops. So I guess we should have used that in a shop. Also, spyglass reveals the target area of the overworld map. Why don't we take a look right there? Okay, good to know. Warpstone moves us up to three spaces on the overworld map. But uh, let's go do this. So this is the temple uh, level. This is another thing that I'll talk about as maybe a, um, a weakness of the game. But it's, it, it's not necessarily an objective weakness. It might just be something that on first impressions feels one way. Uh, but once you get a little bit more first in the game, mechanics feels differently. There's a lot of systems at play here to the point where I would call the game a little inelegant. You know, it, it's not very minimalistic. And I do have a, uh, a tendency to kind of prefer minimalistic games. So there's, you know, this temple mechanic. Oh, we gained rank one favor here. Um, so he's going to become our deity. Boosts you and your followers movement speed, attack speed, and cooldown reduction. Sweet. Fantastic. Um, I mean, that's good. But there's so many different kinds of things going on here. It took me like three runs to realize that we got different skills every time we played as a kid. Or every time we played, even if we were the same class. Uh, it, it took me a while to realize that, hey, not only are there shops, but there's blacksmiths. There's jewelers. There's, um... The bazaar, where you, like, basically I'm getting at, there's like nine different kinds of shops. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not necessarily by a ton. Um, and for a lot of people, that's going to signal, hey, this game has a lot of variety. For me, at least at first blush, what that means to me is there's a lot of shit for me to wrap my head around. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it does mean that it, it is not a game like, um, 
Let me try to think of a good example here. It's not a game like Dead Bull, which I covered yesterday, where basically in, in two seconds you can you can figure out what's going on with Dead Bull and be like, I've got my head around it, now it's all about getting my mechanical skill better. There's a lot more actual uh, like learning of mechanics and stuff that goes along here. That doesn't make it a bad game by any stretch of the imagination. You know what kind of game has a, a lot of uh, a lot of learning associated with it? Maybe a grand strategy game like uh, like a Europa Universalis 4, a game that I played a lot of and, and like a great deal. Let's see if there's anything here. Um, you know what, for 10 gold, I'll get the cheese. Oh, we also got uh, another ability here with this active item staff. So for Q, uh, we can now um, bind enemies in place. So let me try that. As you can see, that's really nice. It's nice to have something that kind of, it's not really a stun, but something that, that holds enemies in place so I can hit them without having to worry about uh, an escape or so, them escaping. Because a lot of enemies do teleport. These guys also eat corpses. I really think that, I don't know why I sounded so excited. These guys also eat corpses. But um, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice thing to say that there's a lot of enemy variety in the game and kind of unique enemy variety as well. Like you're not just exclusively fighting goblins, skeletons, etc., etc. I mean, there, there are a lot of those, but at the same time, um, they they have unique mechanics that are not necessarily just like, hey, RPG 101, right? Uh, the other thing that I'll say, uh, not even as a negative, but just as a, a point that you should be aware of going in here, is that. Um, if you haven't played a MOBA before, I can't really speak to the learning curve. I played, like I said, I'm not good at Dota 2, especially not having played it forever. But um, I, I played enough of it that, you know, keeping an eye on all these skills, not saying I'm using them optimally, but keeping an eye on all these skills is not something that is foreign to me. You know, that's like, I'm pretty used to it. And uh, I, I can get away, as much as it might make you laugh because of how I play in Isaac sometimes, but I can get away with uh, not just holding the attack button down and actually trying to use a little bit more strategy. He says as he prepares to die, but to be fair, we are you know, not at the entrance of the game or anything like that. Um, ooh, that got stuck on a rock there. Um, if you're not familiar with a MOBA, you may have a little bit more... Uh, trouble, I guess, getting into it and remembering that you've got all these skill sets uh, to worry about and stuff like that. Um, but if you if you've played any length of time in, uh, you know, Guardians of Middle Earth, even not to mention Dota 2 and League of Legends, etc., uh, you're going to be able to wrap your head around it pretty quickly. Um, let's go back to the main menu here. I don't know if I'm going to do one more full run, but we can at least do one more run. Uh, maybe as a different character. Maybe we'll be a. Let's reroll. Hey, I, excuse me, I want a dwarf. I know how to do a de deal with the dwarves here. Where's my dwarf at? My win streak's just getting, it's getting abysmal here. There is also other stuff like there's a live Twitch integration here, which is kind of cool. Um, if you're, if you are a streamer or you're looking for streams. I, I'm starting to think that the dwarf's not going to show up. There we go. So we got a dwarf with a musket. He's got an earth slam. Flame wave we already saw. Uh, musket knockback. Attacks have a chance to stun enemies and deal bonus damage. When not attacking, your next ch attack's chance to stun continually increases. So it, it incentivizes us not shooting constantly, which is good. And skeleton mines. This seems like a pretty good balance. Um, okay, so it shoots out like a triple shot style here. Left shift is flame wave, which we saw. Space is the skeleton mines. And mouse right is our stun. I, it seems okay so far. It's kind of a good balance. Um, skeleton mines are the kind of thing that we can just throw out at any time. I'm not sure how the musket's gonna be, but we'll find out. Uh, skeleton mines we can throw out at any time, which is good to have something to just kind of like do when we've got nothing else to do. And uh, the the stun can be used as kind of like an interrupt when enemies are about to attack us, or if we want to go like super aggressive, we can uh, we can get him with that, or we could even uh, initiate with that. Like this guy comes close to us, we interrupt him, drop skeleton mines when we uh, when they come off cooldown. The mines can be killed by projectiles or or really any attack, I think. And the Dwarven Earth Slam, as you can see right there, just has a ton of um, AoE on it. I'm not sure what the Flawless Streak gets us either, but, you know, if you can get through a level without getting hit, that does seem to be the best. I just thought out on the fly of something that I would also consider to be kind of another complaint. However, they've actually addressed it, so you know what? Don't even, uh, don't even listen to me. What I was going to say is that sometimes, um, like, I'm, I'm accidentally using Flame Wave here a lot instead of uh, Skeleton Mines. And the reasoning behind that, or not the reasoning, the reason behind that is because I had skeleton mines on an earlier run, and they were mapped to left shift. So I'm like, left shift is skeleton mines. My brain has already got that. But left shift is not skeleton mines. It's a uh, flame wave here. 
These are spectral enemies. I can't kill them. Gotta kill these, uh, the, the big guy first. However, they do allow the ability to uh, remap your skills after you get them. So, for example, there you go. Now I can put the skeleton mines on left shift. You know what? That is a very astute design decision that I appreciate a great deal. Um, let's buy some cheese. Let's buy some attack speed. Let's buy some attack damage and skill mastery. Haven't really mentioned it, but here's, you know, this is the shadow that's moving behind us and has now just overtaken us. And every day, the shadow moves forward one more uh, place, even if we're not moving to a square that's, uh, that's new. Now, this may be a little tricky. I should be using the skeleton mines more often. This may be a little tricky. We're, uh... We don't really have an escape here, except for stunning enemies, so that may not be super functional for us. Uh, and I'll probably take a lot of damage here, but I'm actually not really intending to finish this run anyway. I kind of just started it for academic purposes to show you that there are different skills involved. Uh, and, and there's even like a lot of mechanics I have not touched on in, in what is sure to be... Uh, you know, I guess at this point approaching like a 25 to half hour long video. Um, but I, I think I've pretty much shown off what I wanted to show off of Flame Break anyway. Uh, I think the biggest thing that works against it is the fact that it looks kind of generic, but mechanically speaking, it, it looks competent. I don't mean like the, the character designs and the enemy designs look fine and, and the assets look okay. It just looks a little bit like... I, generic is the word that I, I feel most comfortable using because it's not rude, but is also strictly true in my perspective at least. I'm not saying the game looks like shit. It looks a little iOS-y, I guess, is the other way that I would describe it, even though mechanically speaking it, it couldn't be further from it. Um, but it doesn't look bad, and mechanically speaking the game is actually excellent. Like, I found the moment-to-moment -moment game uh, gameplay really, really engaging. Uh, I think as a result of the variety of different attacks and, and strategies you have to employ dynamically on each and every run. So, a lot of the times when I play roguelikes, uh, roguelites, I guess I should say, and I'm gonna single out a couple of games that I single out fairly frequently, A Wizard's Lizard and um, Our Darker Purpose. I'm not shitting on those games, but when I was playing them I was like, you got cool ideas, but the actual, like, shooting enemies stuff is kind of boring to me. And that's, they could be the kiss of death in a game that you know, is an hour long, but you play it 200 times. This does not suffer from that problem. And it's the thing that works most in the game's favor, and I think actually makes it a very compelling pickup at uh, at a relatively low price as well. So, um, we'll go back to the main menu here. I've never beaten a run of this. They, they tend to be relatively short, um, from what I've seen on the, uh, on the daily challenge leaderboards as well, or at, at least I should say. Like, for example, you can see daily, daily hard, nightmare mode. Uh, on the daily challenge, it looks like the average run is like, well, the average run in the top 10 is like 18 minutes. So even if you expect the average run apart from that would be like 30 minutes, that's not that long. Although it is, you know, irrespective of the amount of uh, time you spend on shops and stuff like that. What I'm getting at is like, it's like an Isaac length. Um, but yeah, I'm really impressed with this so far. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed the video. There will be a link in the video description below to pick up, pick up Flame Break if you are interested. It's on Steam, $10 USD, uh, $11 Canadian. And I am actually having a you know, justifiably fun time with it at that price point. Uh, this is something I could see showing up in the NLSS. I'm not gonna do a whole series on it just because there's other stuff coming out, which kind of sounds derisive to this game, but I don't mean it that way. Um, but I'm not gonna be running this and Gungeon at the same time is what I guess I'm trying to get at. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, click the like button. Helps out a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you wanna see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching and I will see you next time.